We're going to focus today on the question about di screening and diagnosis for children with autism spectrum disorders. We will spend a little time talking about screening and, and the process of, of screening and diagnosis and a bit about intervention then, about how the diagnostic process leads directly to intervention planning. During this webcast, we'll be looking at what constitutes screening, how it, who does it, and, and how it's done. We'll be talking a bit about the importance of an accurate diagnosis for children with autism spectrum disorders. One of the questions that, that comes up is, don't, what difference does it make whether or not a child has a disability category of autism or a diagnosis of autism? And we'll try to speak to why that might be important. We'll talk a bit about the diagnostic process, about who does it and how it is done, and consider some of the instruments that are involved in doing a good diagnostic evaluation. I'd also like to spend a little time talking about the family role in the process. Parents are critical members of the team as we come to the process of diagnosing autism in children. We'll talk a bit about comprehensive assessment. Uh, in a school context, comprehensive assessment is um, generally the rule as we approach eligibility, and we want to talk a little bit about what that means. And then finally talk a bit about early intervention, about how we move from assessment to the intervention process. So to begin with screening, screening is often thought about as a kind of a universal process that is, that, that we screen the general population for a particular problem. And that's often how it's viewed in the, with respect to autism spectrum disorders as well. Screening is generally assumed to take place in the primary health care context. And the American Academy of Pediatrics has taken the position that, in fact, universal screening should happen in pediatrics practices. And so the guidance document says that for all children, a level one autism spectrum disorder specific tool, for example, the MCHAT, should be administered at the 18 and 24 month visits. What this means is the parents might expect when they take their child in for their well child visits at 18 months and 24 months, that the pediatrician will administer some form of a standardized structured screening for autism spectrum disorders. As the guidance document suggests, the most common instrument that's used in pediatrics offices is the MCHAT, the Modified Checklist for Autism in Toddlers. It's a parent report instrument, uh, takes only a few minutes, and uh, gives some basic information about whether or not a child is displaying characteristics of autism spectrum disorders. In a school context, it's unlikely that most schools will practice universal screening. We don't really have a universal screening mandate for autism in the schools. But there has certainly been a call for schools to be doing more active case finding with regard to children uh, with autism spectrum disorders. Nolan and Gabriel's put out a model for what such a screening process might look like or how, the, how schools might approach the task of more active case finding of children with autism spectrum disorders. They suggested that school divisions develop documents that they called red flag documents for identifying what are the social interaction, the communication skills, and the challenging behaviors that one might watch for in a child where there, where there might be a question of autism. And so developing these red flag documents provides the basis for staff training for, to encourage folks in schools to be actively looking for characteristics of autism in the students that they interact with. If such screening is going to happen, we're going to need to have some kind of a, a protocol for how the division expects it to, to happen. And while we don't have a, a standard uh, 
uh, state-suggested protocol for such, such screening activities. I'd like to offer some suggestions about what might be included in such a protocol. Such a protocol would, would imply that there would be a standardized instrument available for teachers and school personnel to use to answer the question about whether or not this is a child who should be referred for a more comprehensive diagnostic evaluation. We'll talk about what some of those tools might be in a few minutes. But first of all, what, what are some of the, the practices that a school division might put in place in order to accomplish such screening? One possibility is that school divisions might choose to screen all students as a part of their initial eligibility for special education. This is certainly not universal screening, but it is focusing in on that group of students who are most likely to manifest characteristics of autism spectrum disorders. And so a division might choose to include in their initial evaluation for any child who is referred for special education eligibility, include an instrument that systematically addresses the questions of characteristics of autism spectrum disorders. A second point at which students might be screened would be when they move from developmental delay to some other disability category, when students age out of the developmental disability category, the developmental delay category. This would be another reasonable time for a structured instrument to determine whether or not the child displays characteristics of autism spectrum disorders. And finally, schools might choose to screen any student for whom a parent or a teacher or a healthcare professional has suggested the possibility of an autism spectrum disorder. This mirrors the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance, which suggests that additional screening should happen in pediatrics visits whenever somebody has raised a concern about an autism spectrum disorder. If someone has mentioned that this child looks like they might be a child with an autism spectrum disorder, it is reasonable to implement a structured standardized screening tool. A division protocol for screening should also then include a specific path to follow when a child screens positive for an autism spectrum disorder. That is, what Assess what further assessment procedures will the division undertake in order to clarify whether or not this child meets the criteria for the disability category of autism. There are a number of screening tools available for use in any of a variety of contexts, including schools, and I want to mention three of them this morning. First of all is a, the Pervasive Developmental Disorders Screening Test. It's in the second edition at this point. This instrument was designed for children, for young children, uh, aged 12 to 48 months. It is a relatively brief instrument and, and easily done, uh, and it's available through Pearson Assessments, the division of, of PsychCorp. This instrument is actually preferable for, to the MCHAT for a, a school context. Uh, the MCHAT is specifically designed for 18 and 24 month old children who are less likely to be seen in a school context. And the pervasive developmental screening test probably is more appropriate for the kind of characteristics that we're going to see in those kids who are just coming into school services. A second instrument that I would mention as a, as a possibility for a standardized screening tool is a social communication questionnaire. This instrument was devised for children who are over four years of age, chronological age, and to have a mental age of over two years. It is one of the best uh, researched inst screening instruments in, on the market. It was uh, developed as a tool to mirror some of the questions that are in the autism diagnostic interview, which we'll talk about a bit later. The social communication questionnaire is available at Western Psychological Services. The third tool that I would mention today is the autism spectrum screening questionnaire. This instrument was developed for children and adolescents with symptoms of characteris characteristic of Asperger syndrome and or other high-functioning autism spectrum disorders.
this is a tool that might be useful for children who don't display classic autism, who may have actually slipped through the cracks early on in their school career, but who are identified sometime later as displaying some characteristics of autism spectrum disorders, uh, who are maybe capable in many ways, but are, we're seeing the features of the social and communication features that might indicate autism. This instrument is not commercially available, but it was published in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders in 1999 and uh, can be taken from there. That then is a bit about what, w how one might approach the task of screening. We talked a little bit about screening in, in healthcare set settings, but also more specifically screening in uh, school settings. And what are some of the approaches that one might use and the tools that one might use for such a screening task? For those children then who screen positive for an autism spectrum disorder, the next question really is, does, is this a child who meets criteria for a diagnosis of autism, either a clinical diagnosis according to DSM or an educational, special education, disability category diagnosis uh, according to the education regulations? We should think first about the question of really what constitutes a diagnosis. The def dictionary definition talks about an the art or act of identifying a disease from its signs and symptoms. This definition, I think, is a little bit less helpful for us, uh, in, particularly in a school context. And I would go back to the original meaning of the word diagnosis, comes from those words that meant uh, to distinguish, that is to sort of to s distinguish one, one condition from another, one problem from another, and that's really what our task is with respect to diagnosing autism in an educational context. We will use the term diagnosis for this presentation to include both the clinical diagnosis that would happen through the healthcare system and the identification of disability category that happens through the education system. Just a word then about what a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder is not. It is not really a name for a specific disease. And it's, not, it's clearly not a definitive statement of the final cause of the problems that the child is, is manifesting. The biological research in autism spectrum disorders is pretty clear that this, this final uh, behavioral presentation that we see that we call an autism spectrum disorder has many, many different ways, different pathways that a, a, child can, that can, a child can follow in order to reach that final behavioral presentation. There are many different kinds of biological differences and problems that, that might yield such a, a pre, an autistic presentation. And so we're not, when we talk about diagnosis, we are not identifying the final cause, that what is the underlying uh, uh, specific biological condition, but we are describing uh, behavioral, cognitive and behavioral differences that, uh, that manifest themselves in a child. We do think that a good diagnosis should be a label whose defining characteristics match those of the child in question. And so, we, when we offer the label of autism or autistic disorder or Asperger's disorder, we're, we're providing a shorthand label that has attached to it certain defining characteristics. And our assumption is that if we do a do good job with our diagnosis, those defining characteristics will be true of the child in question. The second thing that a good diagnosis should do is point people in the right direction with respect to intervention. And this is probably the most important point about diagnosis. That is that it should give us a label that points us in the direction of things that will be helpful to this child. It should point us in the direction of specific kinds of difficulties that the child is maybe encountering, and it should point, point us in the direction of specific kinds of interventions that might address those, those difficulties. So the goals of, of a diagnostic assessment are really to arrive at that label, that label for which the defining characteristics accurately describe uh, 
the child's challenges. And so if we say a child has an autism spectrum disorder, that conjures up in our minds certain kinds of difficulties with social interaction, certain kinds of communication challenges, and certain kinds of repetitive behaviors or patterns of interest that should be descriptive of the child in question. Further, the a diagnostic assessment should state clearly how this particular child meets the defining characteristics of the diagnostic label and which of those associated characteristics are true of the child and which are not. So first, with respect to the defining characteristics, we know as we think about the DSM criteria for autism or the other descriptions of autism spectrum disorders that are in the literature, there's considerable variation. Uh, and it's certainly true that a young nonverbal child will present with autism, will present with quite different features from a verbose pre-adolescent with, with Asperger syndrome. And so this, the next step then of the diagnostic assessment is to say how this child meets the defining characteristics of, of the diagnostic label. Which of the characteristics that we associate with autism does this child meet and how are they manifested in this child in terms of the child's thinking in terms of, and in terms of the child's behavior. And then finally, the diagnostic assessment should map out, at least in broad terms, what direction for intervention is indicated by those identified characteristics. And so if we identify that a child has some of the cognitive features that we associate with autism rigidity, for example, we might, th that might indicate a need to design an intervention that addresses cognitive rigidity. For a child whose communication problems include uh, in, an, an inability to uh, initiate or to terminate a conversation. We might say those are, the, those are the defining, some of the defining characteristics of an autism spectrum disorder, and we might include interventions that, that focus directly on those things. Finally, with respect to diagnostic assessment, I mentioned earlier we want to be clear about what are the associated characteristics that are true of the child. So there are some characteristics that are often associated with autism, but that are not part of the defining characteristics and not part of the diagnostic criteria, our diagnostic assessment should identify wh wh when those are present in the child as well and be clear about what they are. A common example of this for children on the autism spectrum you know, are the, is the sensory differences that we often see. And so there are many children who are, for example, hypersensitive to uh, auditory stimuli. This is not a defining characteristic of autism, but it is certainly seen very frequently in children on the autism spectrum. And if it's true in this child that we are evaluating, we want to be clear about that. We want to, to identify it specifically as a characteristic that is true of the child and that has implications then for intervention. So if we ask the question then, why does an accurate diagnosis matter? The first answer really is that we want others to know what is the, the shorthand label that we use that, that describes the child. We, we, want them, we want people to be aware that, that this child is somewhere in the neighborhood of what we call autism. Secondly, we want others to know how to interpret the child's behavior. And this is particularly important for children on the autism spectrum because they will often manifest behaviors that are challenging, that are disturbing, uh, that may even be dangerous. And we want folks to understand to what extent are, can those behaviors be attributed to specific features of an autism spectrum disorder, and what does that tell us then about how we should respond to those behaviors. And so, for example, if a child is continuously interrupting, it might tell us that this is a child who can't read the social cues that say when it's okay to speak to me, and that as opposed to just telling the child, stop interrupting, we're going to try to teach them how to read people's social cues in order to, uh, in order, so that they can make a good decision about when, it's, when is the time that, I should, uh, that uh, he should speak to me. In that way, the diagnosis helps to point us in the direction of, of an intervention that is going to be more fruitful for, for the child with autism. And so the last point about the importance of, of an accurate diagnosis is that we will choose those helpful interventions as soon as possible in the child's school experience and that we don't head down a path of interventions that turns out to be not fruitful for a child on the autism spectrum. A further instance then of, of 
the importance of having an accurate diagnosis. We might consider the example of a child with an autism spectrum disorder who is described clinically as a child with an attachment disorder. If a child, if this child is seen in a mental health setting and is, is diagnosed with an attachment disorder, it will lead to a very different choice of interventions. It will lead to a very different explanation that we offer to parents. And for a child with an autism spectrum disorder, those interventions and those explanations are not likely to be helpful and may in fact be, be harmful or at least hurtful to, uh, to parents. A second example, maybe a little bit more controversial in a school context, is that a student with an autism spectrum disorder is identified as a student with an emotional disability. Now it is certainly true that a student with autism disorder can have anxiety, can have uh, emotional difficulties, but if instead of a, for this child, if instead of thinking about him first as a child with an autism spectrum disorder, we think about him first as a child with depression or with psychosis or with conduct disorder, our interventions are not likely to be well matched to the child's needs and are not likely to be very effective. We've been talking about diagnostic assessment and we might ask then in what context does such diagnostic assessment happen? We know that for many children with autism spectrum disorders, they are seen maybe first or at least in, in, in parallel with uh, school services in the healthcare setting and are offered a clinical diagnosis. Most typically that Clinical diagnosis is provided, by, is provided by a licensed healthcare professional such as a developmental behavior, behavioral pediatrician, a pediatric neurologist, a child psychologist, or a child psychiatrist. In the school context, the diagnosis happens typically in the eligibility committee. And the special education regulations have been pretty clear about this, that, that the intent is that the assignment of the disability category label will happen as a part of the eligibility process by the eligibility committee. In either case, a good diagnostic assessment is going to include some key components. First of all, it's going to include some clinical or behavioral observation. Someone is going to be looking at this child in some context that provides us with real life information about their interaction with other people, about their communication, and about how they occupy their time uh, in terms of, of repetitive behaviors. So observation is going to be an important part of any diagnostic evaluation. We're going to want to get parent and teacher report of characteristics of autism. We might use some of those screening instruments that I talked about earlier. But in any case, we want to be sure that we are eliciting information from the key context in which the child functions. And that is primarily home and community from parents and school, the school classroom from teachers. A good diagnostic evaluation will include the use of structured diagnostic instruments and we're going to talk about more of those uh, in just a minute. And finally, there's a general consensus in the field that a good diagnostic process really requires the input of a multidisciplinary team. That is, a, a multidisciplinary team comes together to offer the various perspectives of their disciplines on the question of, is this a child who is appropriately seen as a child with an autism spectrum disorder? To go back then to the question of structured diagnostic instruments, there are a couple that I want to highlight because these instruments have been seen as state-of-the-art instruments. They're, they are not perfect by any means, but they are probably the best that we have available to us at this point for identifying the presence of characteristics of autism spectrum disorders. The first one is called the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. The technical name is called generic, the, sometimes called the ADOS-G, most commonly just called the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. This instrument was developed some years ago by Catherine Lord, Michael Rutter, and Pam DeLavore. It is a direct observation instrument in which the examiner interacts directly with the child in a variety of play contexts. Um, and so a fair amount of it, particularly the, the modules that are focused on younger children and children with more significant impairment, uh, 
uh, in, occurs almost entirely in the context of play activities. The upper modules include interview questions that, uh, that focus on, for example, a, a child's understanding of relationships, a child's un understanding and ability to express uh, emotions. These are key things that we might look for in children who are higher functioning but who still have characteristics of autism. The instrument was designed to provide explicit presses, that is, particular activities that, that will elicit those language and social behaviors that we associate with autism or will elicit, uh, will make clear that the child is lacking in specific language and communication skills that we would expect a typically developing child to produce in those specific contexts that are, that are provided. The ADOS is a standardized instrument. It includes uh, coding for specific behaviors and uh, cutoffs that provide us with some guidance about a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder. But it's my belief that one of the major contributions of this instrument really is that it teaches us what to look for as manifestations of autism spectrum disorders in individuals across the age span and across functioning levels. And so th this instrument gives us specific behaviors to watch for, specific situations in which we, which we might expect those behaviors to occur, and specific uh, sort of features of those behaviors that will help us to understand, is this, is this child presenting as a child with autism in this particular context? The other significant contribution of the ADOS is that it improves agreement across diagnosticians. One of the challenges of providing diagnostic assessments for children with autism in a clinical context and in a school context as well actually has been that it's difficult to get agreement across diagnosticians unless we use some more structured kind of instrument. And the ADOS provides us with a tool that improves agreement, doesn't make it perfect still, but certainly improves agreement across examiners. A second structured diagnostic instrument that I would like to highlight today is the autism diagnostic interview. It's currently in its revised edition. This is the, uh, the only one I believe that's commercially available. This is an interview for parents or caretakers. The purpose of this instrument is from the, as the manual states, for elicit a full range of information needed to provide a diagnostic, diagnosis of autism and to assess, assist in the assessment of related disorders here referred to as autism spectrum disorders. The point being that the, this parent interview allows us to gather information from a variety of contexts and not just from direct observation of the child. The ADI can be used for an individual of any age uh, and of any set, in, in, in any setting. It can be used in a school context, in a clinical context, uh, in a mental health setting. It is appropriate for only for children or individuals who have a mental age of at least two years. Uh, and so for, for folks with, with a mental age below two years, while one can administer the ADI and you can, can still get good clinical information, good detailed descriptions about behavior, the algorithms that are in, intended for, for, making, for establishing the cutoffs on uh, the diagnosis are probably not appropriate for individuals with a mental age below two years. The ADI is done with a parent or caretaker. This informant is, needs to be someone who is familiar with the child's behavior during the age period from four years, zero months, to five years, zero months. This is a, a critical time for the manifestation of characteristics of autism. And so we're particularly interested in talking with an individual who has good information about what the child looked like, how they behaved uh, in that, during that period. Some of the major contributions of the ADI, I believe, are that it, it does elicit from parents and caretakers detailed diagnostically relevant information about the child's early development. This is a considerable instrument. It takes a substantial amount of time and in, in invested in, in completing it, uh, but it does provide us with a wealth of 
really good information about a child's early development. A second major contribution, I believe, of this instrument and, include, and a reason for including it in a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation is that it engages parents in the diagnostic process. And by using this instrument, we communicate respect for the parent's contribution to a diagnostic assessment. That is, the parent has information that no one else on the team has. And it's important that we do our very best to elicit that in a way that communicates respect for that contribution. Finally then, as I mentioned earlier, the ADI provides information about a child's behavior in home and community contexts. And these are important because in most cases we are unable to observe the child in those contexts. And so we need to know what happens, how does this child behave in a home context? How does the child behave when they go to church or synagogue or to the Y? What kind of behaviors are observed in that context where we will never have the chance to see him? I want to take a minute then to emphasize the family role in the diagnostic assessment process. There is a developing literature about what constitutes family-centered practice. Some of this is focused on healthcare settings, but the principles really apply to education settings as well. And in fact, the early intervention system has probably been a leader in terms of emphasizing the need for a family-centered practice. Uh, and we can learn much from, from folks who are skilled in early intervention uh, assessment and, and, uh, and intervention. And so family-centered practice means that we are including parents as full partners in the assessment team and that we are turning to them for useful information about the child's behaviors, about when those behaviors occur and in what context, about when they were first seen. Uh, there's a, a wealth of developmental information that we depend on parents as active partners in the team to provide. Once again, I think it is our job as members of assessment, diagnostic assessment teams to communicate respect for parents' expertise and for their contribution to this assessment and treatment planning process. Family Center practice means that we, that we communicate clearly that we value what parents bring to the table. And finally, the role of parents in the process, I think, helps us to remember that a lifespan perspective on this child's disability condition is essential. That we cannot, that while we may be faced with the task of writing goals and objectives for the coming year, that in fact, this, we cannot be limited in our perspective to just what's going to, be ha going to happen in the coming year. And we need to be attentive to parents' concerns about long-term prospects for this child. We're not going to make predictions that, that we can't, that, that are not justified, but we're going to be attentive to those parents' concerns. We're going to be attentive to parents' hopes and dreams for this child, about what, what do they imagine that this child will accomplish, and we, we will incorporate those hopes and dreams into our thinking as we, uh, as we provide a diagnostic assessment for the child and as we approach treatment planning. In a school context, a diagnostic assessment is typically part of a larger comprehensive assessment. At least we hope that it will be, and this is generally true in the eligibility process for special education. And so in addition to the diagnostic assessment tools that we've, that we've just spoken about, a comprehensive assessment is likely to include assessment of other things as well about this child. So we're particularly interested when, the, when it is a question of an autism spectrum disorder, we're particularly interested in the child's social strengths and their social needs. What are the things that this child does well in a social context? And where are the things, where are the situations in which the child's skills appear to fall apart or to fall short. We want to be sure that we have a good understanding of communication strengths and needs. Communication is a, is a critical part of the autism spectrum disorder and we want to understand in considerable detail how does this child's communication, how has this child's communication development proceeded? What are the areas that have come along, the, the strengths that the child uh, displays at the moment, and what are those communication differences 
that are really holding the child back and which may in fact be associated with an autism spectrum disorder. We're interested in cognitive de developmental status. How is this child's cognitive development coming along? And that provides us with uh, another point of data to understand the characteristics of autism that we're seeing. I mentioned sensory differences earlier. A comprehensive assessment will certainly attend to the sensory differences that are commonly seen in children on the autism spectrum. Challenging behaviors. This is what often brings kids to the attention of, of healthcare providers or uh, special educators early on because there are challenging behaviors that, that need to be addressed in some, in some way. And so we need to have a good comprehensive understanding of what behaviors is this child manifesting. And in many cases, this will lead us to a functional behavioral assessment to understand what are the environmental features that are both likely to prompt challenging behaviors and that may in fact be maintaining those behaviors. Comprehensive assessment will also address physical health status and needs. There are some physical concerns that are very common in children in the autism spectrum, and we need to be sure that we have understood those. For example, gastrointestinal distress is not uncommon in kids on the autism spectrum, may be associated sometimes with difficulties with eating or with limited, uh, a limited diet, a limited food preferences. Uh, sleep differences are very common in kids on the autism spectrum, and so we want to be clear that we have understood whether or not this child has sleep, major sleep concerns that may be impacting performance uh, and behavior in school. And finally then, we have to, to wrap all of those things into a package to consider what impact do they have on the child's functioning in educational context. Each of these things is important in terms of the way the child gets along at, in school, and we want to be clearly identifying how are those features that we associated with autism, these additional features that we've uncovered in our comprehensive assessment, how do they impact on this child's school functioning? And so a comprehensive assessment, as I've just described, really is supported by a well-executed eligibility process. The special education regulations are pretty clear about, about what should go into a comprehensive assessment, and in, that is entirely consistent with what we would imagine is an appropriate comprehensive diagnostic assessment for a child who for whom an autism spectrum disorder is suspected. And such a comprehensive assessment then, we hope, will lead to reasonable intervention planning. All of this data that we have about the child is really of little value unless it leads us to thoughtful, creative planning of how we're going to support the child and how we're going to support his development uh, in moving on in, in um, in terms of those challenges that, that the child is facing. So just a word then about, about appropriate intervention. The, our focus right now is on the question of early, uh, inter, early identification and early intervention. And the purpose of doing that early, of, of providing early screening and diagnosis, really is supported by, by the literature. Rogers published a paper in, in 1996 documenting that children with autism appear most able to benefit when intervention has begun very early, between the ages of two and four, making far more progress than do older children receiving the same interventions, and further that young children with autism may make gains more rapidly than young children with other severe neurodevelopmental disorders. The point of these, these statements being that we want, to be, we want to be catching autism spectrum disorders as early as possible and we want to be clearly identifying those disorders so that the intervention plan that we put in place is created with an eye toward addressing the specific features of autism that we see in this child. We might ask, what, what is early? And I suppose I would say it's as soon as a child receives a diagnosis or an indication that they meet criteria for a uh, disability category of autism. It's important to recognize that the average age for diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder is moving down slowly, not as quickly as we wish that it were, but it is moving down. And so increasingly we are confronted with, with young children for whom the question is being asked, is this a child with an autism spectrum disorder? And we are, are confronted with the challenges of doing a comprehensive diagnostic assessment in those younger and younger children.
Another question the parents often have is what to do while waiting for a diagnosis. Sometimes it takes some time, hopefully not very much time in the context of the school system. Sometimes in, in the healthcare system, there is a long wait for a diagnostic assessment procedure. And the point being here that if, if there is a wait period, it is not, we should not be waiting to intervene, that we should, should intervene on the, on the manifest characteristics that the child presents. For example, if the child has communication disorders, we should, communication difficulties, we should immediately begin seeking a communication intervention. The question of what is appropriate intervention is not an easy one to answer and one that there may be many differences of opinion about, but some of the principles that come out of the scientific literature I think are important to highlight. One has to do with, with the intensity of the intervention. The intervention literature on autism spectrum disorders leads us to believe that early and intensive intervention is a hallmark of those programs that are successfully supporting kids with autism to move forward in their development. A second principle really is that of behavioral psychology, that, that we approach this as a, as a task of behavior analysis, of, of understanding behaviors, that we understand what how uh, behaviors are formed and how they are maintained, and that we use those principles actively in the instruction that we offer children. And finally, the literature would generally agree that intervention is teaching and that it is skill development, that while we may call this therapy, it really is about, about developing the child's social and communication skills and uh, assisting them in overcoming behaviors that may interfere with their effective functioning in a social and communication context. And so it is about teaching. It's about, about skill development. And therefore, the education system bears a critical role in supporting the child's development and, and moving forward. And finally then, early and appropriate early intervention will target developmentally appropriate skills. This is, has, been, has been an issue in some of the programs that, that have evolved over the years. Um, there's, I think, increasing attention to the fact that sometimes in the past we have perhaps focused on skills that were not developmentally appropriate. We need to be clear about what this, where, what this child's developmental status is, where they are in terms of each of the developmental domains, and that we are teaching skills and fostering development that is appropriate, an appropriate next step to where the child is, is currently functioning. And so to summarize the, the material that we've talked about today, we focused on how schools can adequately serve children with autism spectrum disorders, beginning with screening for those children, providing diagnostic evaluations, and then moving into appropriate intervention. And so I would just offer these, these summary points that I believe that, that schools will adequately serve students with autism spectrum disorders when, first of all, they train all their staff to recognize features of autism spectrum disorders across ages and functioning levels so that the very beginning part of that process of screening can be triggered by someone who says, this is a child who is doing things that look like a child with autism, and we need to, we need to address that question. Secondly, a school will develop a screening process using recognized screening instruments and a referral protocol for students who screen positive for an autism spectrum disorder. That a school will have a structured procedure by which this process can unfold. Thirdly, we'll develop a comprehensive multidisciplinary diagnostic assessment process, including the use of evidence-based assessment instruments, some of which we've talked about today. We'll provide training and support for a family-centered diagnostic assessment process. I believe it's of the utmost importance that schools address the issue of how do we actively and and positively include parents in this diagnostic assessment process and in the intervention process. And then finally, schools will use diagnostic assessment data to develop appropriate goals and intervention services for children with autism spectrum disorders really across age bands and, and across functioning levels. Thank you for participating today. I look forward to hearing your questions and comments in the chat session.